I'm Jason Klom, and this is the Comedy on Vinyl podcast. The year is 1979. The album is The Muppet Movie. The artist, The Muppets? Jim Henson and The Muppets? I don't know what we say when it comes to something like this. My guest is Ned Hastings. Thank you for being here via Skype. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited. First of all, I, have, I happen to have this album on vinyl, uh, even though the cover is marred by an advertisement to tell you to vote for it for, for the Oscars. Um, <laughs> it's like a giant sticker on the front. But I'm wondering what made you pick that. Now, I know we went through a lot of options. We did, yeah. But, you know, you've heard Sorry. the show before, so you wanted to make sure it was something that hasn't been done. So what? why this one? Um, well, what struck me, and I'm trying to remember now which interview it was, but you got onto a tangent with one of your other guests about um, a soundtrack, and I can't remember even which soundtrack it was now. Um, but something along these lines. And we had been, you and I had been going back and forth about um, possible albums. And of course, you know, <laughs> I got turned on to this because I work with Dave Willis and, and Casper Kelly and Dave Willis took Steve Martin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so did Andy Merrill. And, uh, you know, basically everyone associated with Adult Swim uh, picked a Steve Martin album. And, um, and then, you know, it just became, well, what, what can we do that's going to be maybe that hasn't been touched yet? And then I thought, well, gosh, you know, the Muppet soundtracks, not just this one, but Great Muppet Caper. And I also have the, the, the Christmas album with John Denver. Oh, wow. Um, awesome. all those, yeah, all those I got on, well, I mean, yes, it is. <laughs> all those I got on vinyl and, um, you know, when they were new and when I was a kid and I know them backward and forward. Yeah. And, um, so I just thought, well, gosh, that's one. That's interesting. And then you you responded saying that you had been feeling like you had been neglecting Jim Henson on the show. So Absolutely. That I'm all over that. I'm over I'm all over not neglecting Jim Henson. <laughs> I love that guy. Of course. I mean, how do you not? I, th this is <laughs> this is also I I heard this one for the first time today. Uh, I know the film obviously and it's one of my favorites of all right. time and the ending always makes me cry like a little baby. Um, yeah, but sure. this, I didn't know what to expect. And again, it's very, very, very straightforward provided the one that I yeah. have is not something special that was sent to Academy members and it doesn't look like it is. So I wouldn't think so. No, no. And what's neat about it. And I was thinking about why, um, I, I've got to back up a little bit. I, I was a soundtrack kid, which is really weird. I'm sure to most <laughs> people, but I just was, I, um, I fell in love with movies when I saw Star Wars, like most everybody else. I was 10. Uh, I was just a week or so shy of my 11th birthday. So it was right in that, I was right in that wheelhouse, mm -hmm. you know. And I got that soundtrack. And um, in, in fact, now that I think about it, or I, I've thought about this before, I believe that soundtrack may have been the first, like, because it was on the charts. It was a big album. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody loved that movie and everybody bought that. That was probably the first, like, on the charts new album I ever owned was the Star Wars soundtrack. Yeah. And and again, you're also dealing with a 10-year-old kid who likes orchestral music. I'm not sure what that's about, but that was just me. I just loved it. I've always responded to it. I've always thought it was beautiful, and I love that. So what's interesting about that album and then again about this album is they take you through the movie. They start you at the beginning yeah. and take you through chronologically. And in 1979, or in Star Wars's case, 1977, we, you know, we didn't have v, you know, VCRs and VHS players and or beta, or if you know, we didn't. I'm, some people did. I mean, you know, Bob Crane. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> um, you know, there are people that had you know professional people who had that stuff, but people didn't have that in their homes, and so the only way to sort of recreate that vibe of going to the movie was the soundtrack um all, although star wars you did have the story of star wars i did have the story of star wars also and that's another thing entirely but in this case that was kind of my way to kind of relive the movie um yeah. was was the soundtrack and so yeah they do they start you at the beginning with uh with rainbow connection now there's not a lot of um uh, incident, what I would call incidental music, um, right, right, just melodic stuff. There's, there's the one, um, 
um, non vocal, you know, non vocal instrumental only version of Miss Piggy's big, big mm-hmm. number. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and then, and then there's a little bit of of music, like kind of where the big right before you get to the right before they get to L.A., like the kind of big last push before they get to Hollywood. That that theme that I remember, by the way, playing in the trailer and playing in the TV spots for the music okay. for the movie. Um, but other than that, it's just the songs. It's like the song highlights because, of course, it's a musical. What struck me is that that instrumental version of Never Before and Never Again is a full minute and 20 longer than the, the one with vocals on it. And I was just sitting and I don't get me wrong. I love these songs, but I really love it when the Muppets are singing them. I'm like, when is this fucking ending? How yeah, long is this? Yeah, song? yeah. And as a kid, when yeah. I would listen to it, you know, I mean, I guess you could go over and pick up the needle and move it, but. We didn't do that. And sure. I didn't do that much. I would just sort of let it go and just kind of like, all right, I'm going to sit through this for a mm-hmm. second. And then <laughs> was I used a... to listen. I used to listen to it to go to sleep too. I see. I can see that a lot, um, a lot. And, you know, in the summers when you're and by 79, I was 12. You know, I was 12, almost 13, and that's that age where you're just like you can't go anywhere. It's after a certain time of night, you know. Sure. And, you know, you're just sort of bored. You're too young. You're too old to be a kid, and you're too young to be anything else. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, I remember just that was how I got how I would make myself go to sleep after I'd finished watching Benny Hill and Johnny Carson and whatever else was on. That were, the, I, you know, were all the first albums much. you had soundtracks? Did you have a bu- or did you have any comedy albums to begin with as well? I did have comedy. Well, I mean, I had. Um, uh, obviously I had Let's Get Small, um, huge, huge, huge. Actually, it, funny thing is it was my brother's and I just, just spirited it away from his room and I still mm-hmm. have it. <laughs> um, and then I did, and then by 79, I guess Wild and Crazy Guy had come out too, right? Sure. Yeah, I think so. Um, so I had that, um, you and I talked about the first family. Mm-hmm. Um, my parents had, I still have my parents album of the first family and i used to listen to that um and then you know i don't know what else there there was a a, a, there was a jerry clower album around the house okay yeah that that actually i gotta tell you it kind of made me laugh it really i didn't i didn't hate it i I probably would now but i I didn't look i know i've got one or two of his and i have not listened to them yet but i do have one or two of those sitting around yeah and his albums are weird like I don't remember ever seeing one in the store. I don't even know where we got this. <laughs> it seems like he could like it, it was like did he did he do like nightclubs or did he just do like corporate events and stuff? <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's a very good question because I mean I I have that one. I have that recently got the Pat Buttram album, which again did not know what to expect or that <laughs> Pat he ever Buttram. did <laughs> that he ever even did stand up. But it wasn't really. It was just MCing shit. So, I heard he was really filthy. Where did I hear that? I, that wouldn't. I've also heard that. I've heard that his stand up because he did do stand up. I found out later, but uh, <laughs> I, I have heard that his stand up is filthy, and I think I've had that confirmed by. Uh, well, at least Rob Paulson came on the show and said when he met Pat Buttram that he made a mildly dirty joke, but that he was notoriously pretty filthy. That may be actually where I heard it. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of my information from your I'll, show. By I'll the way. take it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to hear my fat my Pat Buttram story? Yes, uh, please. This will give you this will give everybody a good idea of what a weird kid I was. This will be I, the um, third Pat Buttram story in the history of the show. By the way, that everyone you. needs a good Pat Buttram. This isn't even a good Pat Buttram. <laughs> by the way, this is not just a Pat Buttram story. It's also a George Goober Lindsay story. Ooh, all um, right. When uh, in the Goober, of course, in quotes. When I was, uh, gosh, again, like three or four years old the movie the aristocats Uh came out and we went to see it and um those two play two dogs oh yeah right okay they're these country dogs they're supposed to be in france but they they're country so they sound like pat buttram and george goober Lindsay. and um they're what their names are lafayette napoleon i believe (laughs) that's right and and um so i'm like three or four we had been watching Green Acres on TV and we'd been watching Andy Griffith on TV and I recognized their voices. And to me, I, I think that's just really strange. I don't know. You know, when you're a kid, you don't always necessarily think that these aren't, that there's an actor somewhere recording this stuff and then somebody else animating it. But I remember being in the theater and going, that's, that's Mr. Mr. Haney and <laughs> that's, that's Goober. And yeah, that's, I don't know. I, I don't know if that's weird or not. Hey, no, I, well, 
I mean, I know that when I when I first noticed specifically Rob Paulson, when I first noticed his voice in another show, I felt super proud of myself. It was also kind of weirded out that like, oh, they're like the same people or it's not just like one person per show. I don't know. I don't know what my thought, what, what the thought process <laughs> is, but when you're a kid, logic is not logic. So, right. Yeah. Um, but it's different yeah. also when it's like your experience was two guys with very distinct voices. Sure. Um, absolutely. Goober. Yeah. And I guess I'm not, voice. it's not that I'm that impressed that I recognized like, because their voices are very distinct. Sure. But I think it was, I think it, I think it's funny that I was able to sort of grasp the idea. Because immediately you've got to, you've got to reconcile that. You've got to figure out why these voices are coming out of these cartoon characters yeah. when you don't really necessarily think about it. And also Ava Gabor is in that movie. Oh my God. And she yeah. was on Green Acres also. <laughs> um, and then, by the way, years later when we saw um, The Rescuers. Mm-hmm. And you've got Bob Newhart playing a character who is very much like the Bob Newhart we knew from TV. Uh And that was probably my first experience in a cartoon thinking, oh, wow, this cartoon character is sort of suited to this persona we were already familiar with. Yeah. uh huh. So he because we watched that show religiously, that Saturday night CBS lineup was a must was was we, we, we just watched it all of it. Yeah. Oh, as a kid, a good, such a good show. Oh man, so good. Yeah, because you had Mary Tyler Moore at nine, and Bob Newhart at nine thirty, and Carol Burnett at ten, from ten to eleven. I wish there was no. a way that I could shoehorn any of those talking. I mean, we we did once. We had Jay Sandrich on the show, and we talked about. I those know shows you did in bits. And I pieces, know you did, and that was fun. And I mean, I just forced it. I was like, "Fuck it, I don't care. I'll talk to him." But there's like, I think the only vinyl that that might have, unless there, you know, every once in a while you would find. I have an All in the Family record. And that's got, I don't know. It looks like it might actually be clips from the show. Which Baby is, Joey's theme. <laughs> like, it just, it, I got really psyched that there might actually be bits off of the show, in which case, God. then I could talk about All in the Family, I guess, even though I don't know it that well. But the only, like... Oh, yeah, you want, like, skits or something, right? Yeah, that's that's my guess, is, like, maybe here's a funny scene, uh, and I, I won't make the off-color jokes I'm thinking of, uh, <laughs> just the worst of the episodes becoming... <laughs> Uh, but there is an album, and I don't know if we've talked about this before or not. Maybe Jeff Abraham might have mentioned it before, but there is a record. It's a big time collector album that is was released for the second New Heart show, just New Heart, that was New just Heart. for okay. cast and crew. And oh. it's a Sergeant Pepper cover with New Heart and other cast members on the cover. And uh, <laughs> Tom yeah. Poston. <laughs> yep, yep. And you can get it for a hundred, a couple hundred, it's depending. Peter Scolari. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh wow. And I don't know what's on it. I have seen it in person only once at Arnie Cogan's house, and I desperately wanted to say, "What are you doing with oh. that? Can I please have it?" Um, yeah. But did not. I was kind. But yeah, that's that's the only. There's not a lot of like you don't. I don't get. I'm not going to get the opportunity to talk about a lot of classic TV on the show for that very reason. You know. Sure. Right. Except for as it. As it applies to our influences, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. I mean that 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 will happen because There's, those shows were big, big, big influences on me. Major influences. Sure. Yeah. They're they're huge. I'm I'm still trying to buy all the new heart, the original new hearts on on DVD. Same with Mary Tyler Moore and all those. They're just God. They're I've phenomenal. Got all, I've got all of them. I've got all. I, uh, you know, New Heart was one of those that came out with. I can't remember. Was it? I can't. I guess it was like paramount tv or whoever kind of had the video rights they they came out with them and they stopped at like the third season Boy. all right and i had those and then then rhino came out with a, the five season set so oh, i had, okay i bought i bought that and then <laughs> sold my other ones on on half.com <laughs> um so i've got all those and i've actually been ever since mary tyler moore died now it's been about a month i guess i've been not going through the entire series but jumping through the entire series and like you know i started with the obvious you know chuckles bites the of dust course and, of course and you know um the final episode is really good and then i was like well i'll watch the first episode and kind of see and it's interesting how um you know like every show it's not hitting its gears yet mm-hmm. at the beginning but anyway um man jay sandwich is just all over that show oh yeah big time i mean he's everywhere and and when you did that episode and i listened to it and i i guess as a kid i used to just read credits too because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> i knew that name i knew who jay sandwich was and then years later when i uh years ago now when i worked um 
my first job was at Turner Home Entertainment, which was the home video division of Turner before it merged with Time Warner. And Turner owned the RKO library, and I got really familiar with oh, the, sure. uh, the Astaire Rogers movies. And most of those, I'd say more than half, were directed by Mark Sandwich, yeah. who was Jay's father, cool. including Top Hat, which is, of course, most people oh, yeah, right. can you know, name that as like the quintessential Fred and Ginger movie. Mm-hmm. You know, so you, I always wondered if if they were related, and you you confirmed that for me. Well, good. See, I, this show is a source of research for one person. I will take that. <laughs> Do you now? You mentioned in your emails that uh, uh-huh. that there that the the two seeming uh, the the two currents of influence that seem to go through at, at least Adult Swim were Steve Martin and the Muppets. Were those the two that you said? Muppets was one of yeah, them. Yeah, they're re- they're frequent recurrences um and when i you know when i say adult swim you know now it's gotten a lot bigger but when it started it was a lot smaller and when mm-hmm. i started i was working on aqua teen hunger force and that was created by dave willis and matt malero and both dave and matt are big steve martin fans mm-hmm. so we had that in common and then matt was i don't think i don't know if dave being a big muppet fan but matt malero is um he's a big muppet fan so we had that in common. And then Andy Merrill was around. I think he's a big Muppet and Steve Martin fan also. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they both they both crop up a lot as being favorites for, for people. And, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why mm-hmm. uh, as a common as a common thread. I know why I loved them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know. I, um, I do feel like the Muppets have, if uh, not in the same way, but there there's a couple, at least a generational gap between them and the Warner Brothers cartoons in terms of influence that are you know things that are for also for adults, but that are perfectly yeah. suited to kids. Yeah, yeah, and you know the show. You, I don't know. It was syndicated, so I don't know what time it came on or what night it came on everywhere else mm-hmm. in the world. But in in my world in atlanta it was on seven o'clock on saturday night Mm -hmm. and so it was that you know they used to call that prime time but it was that kind of pre-prime time what i would call hour and but it's fam that's the family hour Mm -hmm. you know that's the that's the after dinner family hour and so you know like yeah like you said with the warner brothers cartoons it 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 appealed to kids but it it appealed to grown-ups yeah um and um you know, there was a, it's a sort of a, a meta show in a way the show was, cause it was a backstage show. Mm-hmm. You know, you had things that happened on stage, quote unquote, and then conversation backstage. Like that's where you saw Scooter. Cause oh, right, he was yeah. the, he was the stage hand. So you wouldn't see, see, say, see Scooter in like, you know, pigs in space. Right. You know? You'd see him. And the great thing is they'd have a sketch, like Pigs in Space, for instance, and then they'd cut to the back stage and Kermit would be like, you know, way to go, guys. And they'd come off stage. You'd see them coming off the stage and like going by and congratulating each other and laughing at the, at the you know, how well it went. And uh, and, and, and so there, there was a weird kind of inside out quality to that show that, that I think I got a big kick out of. Yeah. Yeah, that's not something that you, that you get to see. Uh in much else for kids that I can think of it man that's a good I hadn't right. thought about that and yeah which I think maybe is partially why the Muppet movie at least for me becomes relevant more and more the more I know about the ins, ins and outs of the industry the more it actually feels more legit and I, I don't know if that's just me but or me being over emotional but that definitely seems to be the case for myself what's that the more the movie seems yeah, legit? the movie the movie uh the movie and the, the show as well, but like I don't know, I just I feel like it, it emotionally resonates with me more the older I get. Uh, even uh-huh. if, even if the comedy gets uh, every once in a while, maybe gets a little stale. But I'll, I'll never not like the Muppets. I will always love the Muppets. But like right. I, I think the thing that does grow with it is that desperate love for entertaining as as a thing and as a goal. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that's in the show, but it's heavily in this film, and I. It is, you know, and I don't really is. And I don't know if that's in my subconscious. I I don't know if it's always been there. And that's one of the reasons I'm an entertainer. But I will tell you, it's one of those things that in the darkest nights in my my 20s, I was like, oh, but Kermit still wanted to do it. (laughs) I don't know what that says about me. (laughs) Well, that whole the big number at the end, Mm -hmm. the magic Mm store is all about, you know, you know, I mean, the God, I could I could sit here and almost 
recite the, the the lyric but it's like you know talks about when you're a kid and you and you get the bug and you're making you're you're the class clown and you're making faces in the mirror at home and you know then the first time somebody really responds to you know your behavior mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that you're hooked yeah and that's that's all there is to it and um you know i'm not a performer um i've been lucky enough to be asked to do voiceovers here and there mm-hmm. Um, but I am by no means a performer, but I did have that bug and I, and I channeled it into the creative process. It, as far as I'm concerned, that's my quote unquote performance, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, but it's, the, it's, for, it's the same impulse. Absolutely. And again, this goes back to Star Wars because that tied into Star Wars was not just a movie I fell in love with. I fell in love with finding out how they did it. Okay. Yeah. And that they had a documentary that aired. I remember it airing on PBS, but it's somebody else that it aired on one of the networks. But, you know, it was um, the making of Star Wars. And they showed matte paintings and they showed Ben Burt out there banging on oh, high, you know, on high tension wires with a hammer to make the blast sounds. And, you know, another kid may see that and have the whole losing shattered for him. But I, it just made everything better for me. Yeah. Um, and that was when I, you know, that was the beginning for me. That's where I, that's how I got started well, where I am. I mean, it's the same kind of that story. being an asshole at school. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same kind of story where if, if I've so many, so many times heard comedians, not necessarily on my show say this, but on other shows say, you know, they're watching TV and like, oh shit, that's something I could do. Well, I mean, you don't necessarily mm-hmm. look at a movie, a fully, f- a full put together movie and say, that's something I could do until you see right. the puzzle pieces. And it's like, oh, well shit, that yeah. is something maybe uh, that's approachable. Those people look like me. Yeah. 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 Well, it was certainly, that's something I want to do, whether I, whether it seems feasible or not, mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. I just was, and you know, I just became a, I wasn't a great reader as a kid. I'm still not a great reader, but I would read every article I could get my hands on. And I saved them, by the way. That's so I have good. a box. I'm not surprised. Um, and it, <laughs> and it, yeah, right. And, uh, and it's got original uh, articles that were in the newspaper. It's got original reviews. It's got, oh I cut God. out, um, I cut out newspaper ads. I've got like, a new, I don't know how many newspaper ads from Star Wars, like in various sizes where it's like, Held over 100th Smash Week, wow. you know, back when a movie did well, and they would just keep it in the theater. Yeah, yeah. And Star Wars, Star Wars just stayed in the theater for like a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Like when when he retooled it the first time and added a new hope. Yeah, I I I think they just pulled the old prints and put out new prints. I'm not even sure it was ever off circulation. Oh God, um, I mean, I know I saw it. I didn't see it till the end of that summer. And I saw it five times, mm-hmm. and I did, and not not close together, or maybe four times, but still. Anyway, um, so it's interesting. Actually, I can't talk. I almost can't talk about one without talking about the other, the Muppets and Star Wars. Uh-huh. I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's just because of where that where they hit me mm-hmm. in life. And you know, when did the show go on the air? Was that like '77? That's a very good question. I was actually just looking that up, and then my phone. I'd be willing to bet it was at '78, '77. Around that same time frame as when I was in love with Star Wars, mm-hmm. um, I did happen to read today. I did a little bit of research on the movie because there was I realized there's a lot about it I didn't really know. Mm-hmm. Um, they apparently filmed it during a break in the season, like they they the way they break up seasons now. There was a break in like season two or three, but and and they went off and shot the movie. Wow, yeah, that's um, insane. Yeah. So um, seventy six. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so perfect yeah. Timing. Yeah. Were, were, were yeah. you a Sesame Street kid before that? I mean, were the Muppets a party? I life? was. You know, hey, I was one of the original Sesame Street kids. Really, I was three years old when Sesame Street went on the air. Yeah. There you go. So I was first gen Sesame Street, and I don't really, honestly, I don't remember it like I don't remember watching it, but I remember it being in the house. I had a record. In fact, I may still have it. I need a look. Um, with some of the songs, you know, who are the people in your neighborhood? Mm-hmm. I got two hands, one, two, you know, <laughs> it's those songs. Um, and I think it's got, it's not easy being green on it. 
Uh, makes sense. Um, that makes. I wonder if I have yeah. that one. I have a bunch that are in horrible condition. They were they released a bunch of Sesame Street albums that I I I'm still discovering them as I go. The, this one I remember the songs that involve the people like Susan and Gordon and <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> I remember the mm-hmm. names. Um, they were on the record, but the Muppet voices were not like the. Oh. I don't know who's saying it's not easy being green, but that's it, weird. Yeah, it wasn't Kermit. Yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of why I want to find it because I'm like, did I did I make that up or was I just playing it at the wrong RPMs or, <laughs> you know, because we had the, you know the record players not only had 33 and 45, they also had 78. Yeah, I, I man, I miss so that. So every now and then, I know, right? So every now and then you you you'd get something wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you, you know, and I was a I, I I don't even know. I guess I had a. I guess I just had a record player when I was little, and I had records. So God knows what condition it's it's in. Mm-hmm. Um, Where if I have it, was there stuff that was getting passed down to you by your parents, or that you stole from your parents? I mean, you grabbed yes. one from your brother, yes, which is a common story. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I just sort of adopted his copy of Let's Get Small, and I stole some stuff from. I have an older sister; she's six years older than me, so I stole some stuff from her too. Um, Mom and Dad, you know they weren't listening to their records anymore and they were just, the records were just like in the attic. So I would go up there and dig through them. And that's where I discovered the first family. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was kind of, they didn't have a lot of comedy other than that. Later I stole their, um, their Frank Sinatra LPs. Okay. See, there you go. Um, Yeah. And I mean like they're the original 1959, you know, in the We small hours and, songs for swinging lovers and those that i mean that's you know they got married in 1959 so mm-hmm. they were in that you know frank wheelhouse mm-hmm. of those those great columbia records so it that i got music from mom and dad i didn't get com- they didn't have comedy records um my sister like i said who's older than me she didn't have comedy records but she had a boyfriend who had comedy records hmm. In fact, he may be the one who brought us Jerry Clower, quite frankly. Okay. But you know what else he had? He had what it was. It was football. Oh, okay, sure. The Andy Griffith. Um, that's the first place I heard that. And we were already big fans of the show, so I already knew Andy Griffith as a, as a quantity. And, of course, in the early goings of that show, he would kind of work in some of his act a mm-hmm. little bit. I remember there's, there's one... Uh, where, where he has a bit about Romeo and Juliet, and he kind of works that into an episode about these two kids that are, you know, their families are feuding and the kids are, you know, in love. Um, but what it was, it was football was, was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Now, actually, this reminds me. I wanted to tell you a story about that. Um, years ago, I was watching the Tonight. I was a huge Tonight Show fan as a kid. We, my dad would like it, and I would like it, and they had comedians on, and I would always if there's a comedian i would watch and so i was a big johnny carson fan big tonight show fan i just loved watching the guests come in one time in the 80s i guess well it was whenever matlock debuted Mm -hmm. andy griffith was the guest to pimp the matlock matlock started as like a two-hour tv pilot oh right yeah Um, i mean i guess it wasn't a pilot per se i guess the show was already picked up but it was a premiere episode Mm -hmm. and the villain the killer of the week was dick van dyke some that's awesome so yeah so um andy goes on the tonight show but johnny's not there the guest host is bill cosby Mm. remember when cosby used to guest host every now and then for johnny and um the the funny thing is so i'm watching it i'm 15 or 16 or whatever andy comes out and he and bill cosby give each other this giant bear hug and i realize later i'm like oh you know desi lou because I Spy was a Desi Lu show. Oh, yeah. And so, and so was Andy Griffith. And so was um, Dick Van Dyke. So they probably had all known each other for 20-something years at that point. On the show, Andy Griffith tells this story about the first time he met Dick Van Dyke. And he was it was in Atlanta. So, of course, my ears prick up at that point. Because mm-hmm. you know, anytime anyone mentioned Atlanta when I was a kid, I was like, what? Atlanta? We're important. People pay attention. <laughs> um, and um, Andy was was doing a tour behind what it was. It was football and he was in a radio station and he heard it playing down the hall and he went down and in one of the booths was Dick Van Dyke sitting in a stool on a stool, um, mouthing the words to it, Ah. like lip syncing to it. And at that time he had a show, a live show on, on in Atlanta, um, 
called the Merry Mutes. He had a partner, a guy named Phil Erickson. And uh, this was before the Dick Van Dyke show, before he went to Hollywood and, you know, all that stuff. He had a live show in Atlanta. And they would they were record mimes. That was a thing. Wow. They would, they would play like a hit song, you know, and Phil Phil had it was like a short, squatty guy with a wide face. So they looked like, you know, and then Dick Van Dyke is a tall guy with a long face, you know. They were just funny next to each other. And I've seen clips from it. And then Phil Erickson formed a um, a comedy troupe, um, like a nightclub group called, they weren't like improv. They wrote stuff and they did an act. It was called the, um, the Wits End Players. Mm-hmm. And one of the graduates of that group was Jan Hooks. Oh. Yeah. So he had a, Phil Erickson had a, went on to have a career here as a comedy guy. And uh, Nick Van Dyke went on. So that's my, what it was. It was football story. So, yeah, so my, this guy, and then actually, so my sister and her boyfriend, they came home one Saturday night and they were like, oh, this new show's coming on TV tonight at 1130. We got to watch it. So there I am, eight years old, watching George Carlin host the first SNL. (laughs) (laughs) So I got exposed to that stuff pretty early too. And it was, it was cool, you know, because the high school kids were watching it. You know, my sister was 16 or whatever, you know. So I got exposed to that stuff pretty early. I, I think I got everything more or less from TV, mm-hmm. except for until until Steve Martin came along, and sure. then um, and, and I still didn't have a lot of comedy records after that. I had a Bill Cosby and and Robin Williams, um, you know, Reality What a Concept, mm-hmm. and then and then Monty Python, which that's another story for another time. <laughs> and, and 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 oh, I'm I'm looking forward to us doing that again. Uh, <laughs> the, do you? Was this was the Muppet movie something you really, really, really were looking forward to after seeing the show? Was it like something you yeah. had to wait for? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't remember like being in anticipation for it, of uh-huh. it because I don't know that the you know it's not like now where you have, you know you know movies are coming two years down the pike. Um, but when it when it came out, I was exci- really really excited, and I saw it with my grandmother. Okay. Um, because my grandparents were big fans of the Muppet show, That's huge awesome. fans. Um, I, my grandfather was a in particular loved Fozzie bear. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's a guy who had a, he, he, he really loved a corny, a corny joke. Uh-huh. And I think, you know, I mean, they were old, <laughs> you know, they were, they were, they were born in my, my grandfather was born in 1903. So by 19, you know, he was in his 70s mm-hmm. um, and thank God he lived to his 90s, but he was in his 70s when that show came out. So, I, you know, I think the, I think there's a vaudeville aspect to the, all that that, that sure. I'm sure appealed to them. Um, and but he was sharp um, humor wise. So the the jokes didn't have to be old and corny. I think they just liked the form, mm-hmm. you know, and then the jokes were were mostly pretty funny pretty sharp you know um so they loved it so she couldn't wait to go see it so we went we went and saw it i remember i remember i i, I know the i remember the theater i know where we went i know where we saw it i kind of like that with most of the movies i saw as a kid but mm-hmm. um yeah no and she she loved it and then i think we went and saw the great muppet caper together too when it came out in fact i know we did because we laughed ourselves silly at the big <laughs> musical numbers <laughs> Yeah, of course. God, you know, it's been forever since I've seen that. Uh, but I am drinking out of a great Muppet Caper glass right now. I just in honor of what we're talking about right now. This is very nice. A friend I of actually got really me a vintage re- Muppet Caper glass, and it's a great shape. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh-huh. From like Bur- from like Burger King, was it like? A- I'm trying to see which one. Oh, McDonald's actually. McDonald's. Uh, yep. There you go. I I feel like I remember those. Um. So yeah. So we. I was. And you know the funny thing is though, I think I only saw it. One time mm-hmm. in the theater, um, which I guess isn't that unusual. I mean, you know, but there were a lot of movies I saw more than once. Mm-hmm. James, but Bond it does still it does still Star stick, Wars. like you said, it does still stick in your yeah. head in the same way that Star Wars did. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's something about seeing back then. I don't. I feel like every movie stuck in my head better back then. You know, because I don't know. It's almost like your brain was trained to just like commit it to memory because you it wasn't so easy to see it again. Sure. You know, sure. Without, you know, before HBO and all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, immediately now, if there's something you remembered from it, you very likely can find something about it online, which is great. 
right. but it, it does i mean you know and uh, i don't know i don't know if it's it's great that things are less precious now or not but it, i do r- distinctly remember the feeling that you're talking about and then when the internet yeah. came out i was like oh sh-. i mean was it was a perfect time for me i'm like oh good i don't i don't have to try anymore so this is great so it, it was <laughs> yeah there's 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 plenty to be said for the readily available <laughs> wealth of content that you, we all have do you have a favorite from this album? I'm guessing it's not one of the instrumental tracks. I've been trying to kind of come to grips with that. Um, unfortunately, I think my favorite one is not particularly funny. Uh huh. And but truthfully, my I've just I love. I'm going to go back there someday. Yep. I just I've always loved that song. Mm-hmm. I I literally since I was 12 years old. I can't even, you know, if I'm walking outside now, if I go out to the mailbox and it's late at night and it's quiet out and their stars are out that song will come into my head i mean it did it happened last week that's amazing it still will do that it has always done that and maybe i was just a kid that liked to sit outside and stare at the stars and maybe that that scene appealed to me you know Mm -hmm. because it takes place when they're around the campfire and gonzo's remembering when he flew away with the balloons and all that stuff but i you know it's sappy as hell i know but i can't help it i just yeah i love it um, now, from a humor standpoint, I love. I hope the something better comes along. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I've always been a big Rolf fan, anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, uh, his track with John Denver on the they they sing um, uh, and the on the Christmas album they sing uh, "Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas." And that's probably still my favorite track from that album too. Mm-hmm. Um, there's just something about him I love, and of course that's that's Jim Henson. Uh, you know, the there's something there's something that's always been great to me about the fact that it's Jim Henson duetting with himself. Uh, I love that. <laughs> uh, you know. Oh God, I never really thought about that. That's hysterical. You're right. It's, yeah, it's delightful. And Rolf is oh, great. God. He's just a good character. Uh, I'm, He's a fantastic I character. I don't know why I like it so much. Uh, well, you know, Rolf was the first big star, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Back in he did the dog food commercials. Yeah, there we go. There we go. He used to come on to, I just happen to know this. He used to go on when Jimmy Dean had a variety show. And Rolf would, and and at that time, the Muppets were doing commercials. That's Mm -hmm. what they did. And um, Rolf would do these dog food commercials. I can't remember the name of it. And he would actually come on the show. And, you know, well, Rolf, what's going on? And they'd do a little sketch. And then Rolf would do, Rolf would do the pitch for the, for the food. And then that would be, it was, you know, basically woven into the show more or less. Mm -hmm. Um, And he became a big deal from that. Um, uh, So I'd say he was kind of a first big standout star. Now, you know, they they had that they, again, this goes back to my parents. They had a live show in Washington, in D.C. The Henson did. Mm -hmm. Sam and Friends. At that time, my parents, my dad was in the Navy. And they were stationed in D.C. And they used to watch Sam and Friends on live tv then oh that's so cool yeah so when the muppet show came on they were like oh we've we used to watch the muppets back then and and i think rolf was on that show a lot too so um yeah he was a, he was a big deal he was he was one of their he's like one of the oldest muppets yeah um i'll uh, i'll uh some of this by the way i uh, in atlanta we have the center for puppetry arts do you know about this you mentioned it in an email, but I don't know anything about it, and I'm surprised I don't, because when I was a kid, I really thought I was going to be a puppeteer. Okay, well, get get yourself it. out here. It's phenomenal. It's um, it it it's literally a puppetry arts center. <laughs> mm-hmm. They they make puppets. They do shows. They do experimental puppetry theater once a month. They um, it's I've known people that or puppeteers there. I now have a friend there that works in like the marketing department. Um, they show movies. Um, uh, you have to actually like pay for a membership to go to the movie because they can't charge you to go to see the movie. Or is there some kind of like, you know, it, 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 they, you can't, they can't show it for free or something like that. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Sure. Like th- those rights. But anyway, um, they also have a puppet museum. And um, it started because there was a local puppet troupe called the Vagabond Marionettes, and they kind of used that as sort of the basis of the museum. But the Henson family caught on to this. Jim Henson initially did. And they've been funneling Muppet 
archival stuff to the to the center. Oh. They just built in the last two or three years a huge big wing that's a big it's a puppet museum. Half of it is Muppets. Holy shit. They have a Rolf, they have full size Ernie and Bert, they have a full size big bird. Mm-hmm. I mean, in a glass case that's covered with finger and nose prints because every toddler that sees it walks up to it with his arms wide open and bangs <laughs> into the glass. I almost did. Um, it's phenomenal. Oh. Honestly, truthfully, it is weird when you, like I said, I don't remember really watching Sesame Street as a kid. I know I did. Sure. But when I, even now I'm 50 years old, I was there last week because I wanted to see if they had any stuff from the movie just so I could see if they had it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and, um, something happens when you see big bird it's the weirdest thing it's like i just wanted to like sit down on the floor cross-legged and, and just stare at him <laughs> it's the weirdest thing i can't even explain it it's so strange but anyway uh, the place is phenomenal it's fantastic and right now they've got a huge uh labyrinth uh oh, display really? with, with with puppets and props and photos and um videos behind the scenes stuff I don't know how long it's going to be there, but that's their kind of, you know, they, they have sort of their standing, like most museums, they have their standing stuff that stays there. And then they have, they do like, you know, shows that, you know, come through. Um, but even their Muppet stuff, they've got so much of it that they just rotate it out every once in a while. They'll just pull something out. But they have um, a full room that's basically like a Muppet workshop with like all the drawers and the noses and the eyeballs. Oh, and the, it's a, it's a recreation of the Muppet workshop. They have Jim Henson's desk with like oh. bric-a-brac and stuff on it. Notes that he was writing to himself. Um, Skit doodles guy. We got doodled every, he just must've just done nothing but draw all day long. Uh-huh. Um, so f- again, I'm just fascinated by that guy. He's just fascinating to me. Wow. I, yeah, that is, that is, that's a reason enough to come atlanta now i mean like it, that is, <laughs> it really is i mean the family has absolutely i mean there's family photos on the walls that's of so like cool. when the when like brian and the other kid brian henson and the kids are all little it's the 70s they got crazy hair <laughs> you know it, it's it's amazing i mean they really they, they basically just adopted it and i think because it's so unique and and jim was just like i'm gonna support this and i'm yeah. gonna throw everything i've got at it so it is fantastic um I wish I could tell you, I want to, I wish I could tell you like their website or something like that to, as a plug kind of a thing, but it's the center for puppetry arts in Atlanta. And it's, it's really wonderful. It's really, really terrific. That's amazing. Um, I just reminded myself, by the way, uh, talking about, um, the tonight show, mm-hmm. you know, Kermit, the frog host of the tonight show one time. R- right. Yeah. I've never actually seen that now that I think about it. I've got a tape of it. A friend of mine, funneled it to me it's it's wonderful it's you know the crazy thing is you know johnny used to come on you know the tonight show used to come on after the news mm-hmm. you know the, the local news is 11 to eleven thirty, and then tonight show would come on and so for years initially the tonight show was an hour and a half long mm-hmm. because they'd make up that half hour to midnight and then they'd go to 1 a.m and that was when jim henson when kermit hosted so, you know, you're watching it and you realize, wait a minute, this isn't Kermit the Frog hosting The Tonight Show. This is Jim Henson hosting The Tonight Show. Yeah. On the on the floor, <laughs> under the desk, that's not a puppet studio desk. It's just a desk that he had to sit under for an hour and a half and talk to, you know, Leo Sayer and whoever else. Now, there are, <laughs> there are several musical numbers in it. Um, actually, Leo Sayer is one of the guests. Um, but it's, it's wonderful. It's terrific. And then the other kind of the other Fozzie comes out, Miss Piggy comes out at one point, the other, some of the other Muppets do come out and, and sit with him and, and talk to the guests and to each other. And it's, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. But that's, that's amazing to me. It's one thing to be a puppeteer, um, and to sing songs and to act. It's another thing to host the tonight show. Right. I mean, Bill Cosby hosted the tonight show. You know, mm-hmm. uh, um, Chevy Chase used to co guest host sometimes, you know, I mean, comedians and, and, but not puppeteers. Mm-hmm. You don't think of a guy that with that depth of talent. And then of course, you know, he also later directed the movies, mm-hmm. um, the, the Muppet movies. I mean, of course, Frank Oz went on and directed other movies as well. Sure. Um, now the, the original Muppet movie was directed by, 
a guy who was like an old TV director that had directed the show. Mm-hmm. Um, I looked him up to um, uh, James Frawley. Oh, okay, yeah, I think it's James. Yep, and he yes, had directed is. like he had directed the monkeys, a bunch of episodes of the monkeys. Uh huh. You know, just lots of sitcoms and lots of TV. I think he's actually still directing like shows like um, Grey's Anatomy and stuff like that now. I think he's mm-hmm. still still working. But he directed that first movie and he had been directing the Muppet show itself. Um, which, by the way, I, don't, I I mean, it's an embarrassing. I don't even know how old I was but when I figured out, oh, the Muppet show, the Muppet movie. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was recently. It was in the last year or probably year. Yeah. Uh Where I went, oh, that's why they called it the Muppet movie. (laughs) You know what? I I feel like listening to this, though. Okay, so uh, I want to say a year and a half, two years ago, when we did the Muppet Show album, the first one. Right. uh, Right. That was kind of a revelation because I'm like, oh, cool. They did a really great job of putting that together. I... I feel like they missed something with this soundtrack album. It would have been really cool to have more like bits from the actual movie, like bits and pieces. But it was, I mean, it's very much about the music. It is only about yeah. the music, I guess. But it, yeah, no, you're right. And, and, you know, God knows if there's a way for me to love it more as a kid, that would be it. Right. You know, um, I mean, you had a little line here and there, but usually just to kind of feed into or out of the song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um yeah um it's so you know what's funny i didn't have this the tv show album i didn't have that album of the show the, interesting um so it had like dialogue in it and skits and stuff yeah 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 and if i'm not mistaken god see now now i'm gonna sound like a total idiot because i really did love doing that episode but i think they're all recreations <laughs> of sketches so that they're more fully developed for sound the way they did python sketches oh uh-huh right so and, re-recorded oh, yeah interesting. yeah and they're really good there's one track that's really weird that's just robin singing a very depressing little song um but the rest of it <laughs> as is it's robin's like, want uh-huh apparently God. much i love that character don't get me wrong but yeah it's, yeah, just, it's yeah, like oh this is a fucking weird weird way to <laughs> it's just a weird moment on the album uh like a real sad song but um but it's it's a really it's a good album and it's I, not is it's not easy being green it's got to be on there right I'm trying to remember if it is I mean I'd have to look it up um which by the way he sang that in the first episode oh did he okay see so yeah, that yeah. makes sense um but it was already a known thing I think he must have sung it first either on the Sesame Street I think yeah I think so um it, it well I know he did because it was on that Sesame Street record I had that mm-hmm. wasn't really Kermit's voice mm-hmm. um. <laughs> God, now I gotta find that now. <laughs> <laughs> Just so I can find out what that was. I remember being really deep like this. Like it was <laughs> somebody's like, weird. Oh, I'm supposed to be a frog? Okay, I'll sing it like this. Yes, it is the last it's the last track on side B. Um, okay. So okay. there's a bunch of very weird things. There might be one or two things that are like Menomina, I don't think they had to change because it was just a song. Uh, uh but there are a few oh, other things God. on there that are great. By the way, puppet.org is the official website. Uh, thank you so oh, just good. go there my friend hillary is going to kill me for not having that memorized <laughs> well um, we advertise it that's fine there you go yeah so i, I did i went there last week just because i wanted to see if they had anything mm-hmm. and all they had was a movie all they had was a movie poster um i mean that's all they have currently out now i'm sure they have some stuff from the movie mm-hmm. um which by the way that poster um the album did your album come with a poster do you know because you bought it used. This, uh, right. This one does not have one in it, uh, which now I'm pissed that I don't have Yeah. One. Mine came, it came with a poster. Um, and it's the one sheet. It's the full with the full credit block and everything. That's awesome. Um, and I still I still have it. I pulled it out. Uh, actually, I, I took a picture of it. I was going to send it to you just so you can see it. Oh, yeah. I definitely um, want to see that. That came with a poster. Again, Star Wars came with a poster. The Christmas, uh, John Denver and Christmas, that came with a poster. I still oh. have that, too. Um, I have, I just, I just took them off my wall and folded them up. Mm-hmm. They've got little, they got little tiny holes in the corners from the, the, the uh, thumbtacks that I used to <laughs> tack them up to the wall. Yeah. So that's, that was every other people had posters of like, you know, kiss. Sure. And, and, you know, <laughs> iron maiden or whatever. I had <laughs> the Muppets and <laughs> stuff. like more than one Muppet poster. <laughs> that is fucking great. If I, if I had so any, I, those would have been on my wall too. I had, 
I had my, which I still have, my German Return of the Jedi poster. Oh. My a weird poster for the movie Willow that you could get free if you bought enough Velveeta. Not kidding. <laughs> Uh, I don't even remember that movie. Sorry, Rick Overton, friend of the show, but I don't remember that movie, but I guess I liked it as a kid. Uh, I did. Yeah, see? I, I, well, I wasn't a kid. I was in college, but mm-hmm. I, like, I liked it. I, I've seen it again. I saw it when it came out on D. I haven't. And, uh, yeah. Does it hold up? Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a great question. Rick Overton's really good in it. Yeah, yeah, I don't doubt that. <laughs> um yeah, you know what? I'm just a sucker for certain things, and yeah, I liked it. You know, it was the first thing I saw Val Kilmer in, mm-hmm. and he's great. He's the Han Solo of that movie, right? <clears throat> um, so you know, it's um, and I'm a sucker for Ron Howard, um, movies. Although, even those kind of have, some of them have lost their luster. I hope he's not listening, <laughs> but there several of his I'm I'm big 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 fan of, and so that's kind of one I'm like. You know, George Lucas and Ron Howard is kind of hard to beat. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, it's it's kind of a cool, it's kind of a cool movie. Now, if we're going to take, it, and I, I wonder uh, if if you if you will recommend this, um, only because, you know, my first instinct would be to say, go see the movie first. But let's say somebody, yeah. somebody does, somehow doesn't know the Muppets. Oh, wow. <laughs> You know, and this is somehow their first exposure. What's a good reason? I mean, here's the thing. I will tell you, like, listening to it, at least in terms of nostalgia, it was like, oh, well, shit, I love that song. I love that song. They're all my favorites. Yeah. But I do. what What do you think if you're going to recommend it to somebody who somehow doesn't know the Muppets or know their movies? It'd be a weird situation. Yeah, I know. I, it's hard to imagine that. Mm-hmm. Like, why would you even want to listen to it? And let, well, but again, we all listen to weird stuff that yeah. is divorced from its original source i mean somebody listened to your maury amsterdam album without having seen the dick van dyke show it's exactly point, right know? um i keep going back to that album. um <laughs> <laughs> i'm just fascinated by it um well here's the thing it's hard to not recommend it because it's beautiful i mean a lot of it is just i mean you know right off the the top you've got the the, the rainbow connection which is a really beautiful song absolutely um the only maybe sort of off-putting thing about the, the album would just be that they're, they're character voices, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, most people don't sound like Kermit the Frog, you right. know? So he, um, but, um, or, or Miss Piggy for that matter. She's the harder one to navigate, um, I think. I love the voice. I love Frank Oz, but I yeah, think that yeah. is that would throw you. <laughs> you know what cracks me up about that song, honestly, where I laugh at that song is how terrible she is uh-huh. at singing uh-huh. and i mean and i know that's the point but it's so funny like you hear her breathe mm-hmm. like the song starts with that wonderful like you know overture that big uh vi- all the violins the big orchestral overture and then right before she starts to sing you hear you go <sighs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> it just makes me laugh every time and and you know and then like and then it ends where she like she's supposed to like the notes are supposed to go up and up and up and up and then they just she just breaks toward the top like she can't hit it, you know. Uh-huh. She's just like screaming it, trying to get it out. <laughs> so you know, I mean, it's not a, it's not a comedy album per se, and it's not the songs aren't just pure comedy, but there's some humor in there. Oh yeah, and 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 I think that might be accessible to a a, a newcomer. Yeah. Um. Um. So yeah, it's like I said, it's hard not to recommend it because I love it so much. Of course, um, but I would it'd be impossible to recommend it without saying, if at all possible, see the movie first. Um, but again, I mean that movie might be weird to people. Yeah, yeah, that aren't familiar. But you know what's interesting? I and looking it up today, it's it's on that um, it's on the film registry, the National Film Registry, that film preservation. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm, yeah. The Library of Congress has that. They add like five or ten films every year. Mm-hmm. It's on. It's in there. It it's been set as a as a landmark film. Yeah, which wonderful. I, absolutely. I mean, it's I, I'm <clears throat> assuming the first feature length movie to feature as its main character puppets. I, I it is be my guess. It is okay. It so is <laughs> yeah. They said that it's like the first time, and that's an interesting thing too. One of the things that they did, and and I think these are on YouTube. One of the things that they did was, 
um, before they shot the movie was just they took the Muppets outside. And they were making the show in London, so they, they filmed them around London. Mm-hmm. And I realized, and that confirmed something for me that I was thinking about, we had never seen the Muppets outside before. Yeah, that's a good point. They were always in a studio, even if the studio was supposed to look like outside. It, they had never been in the real world before. Mm-hmm. So that was new to fans of the Muppets, to see them in, interacting in the yeah, real that's world. that's a good point. And yeah, it was the first film feature film to start. Actually, the they said the rain the song the Rainbow Connection. One of the things that's interesting about that moment in the movie, about that opening of the movie, is that's the first time you see full body Kermit. Oh wow! And you know, with his legs sitting up and mm-hmm. his foot is tapping, and he's playing the banjo. And by the way, it took him five days to film that. Jeez. And Jim Henson. Was underwater in a friggin' the whole tank, time. right? God, in that's a tank crazy. With video playback, breathing through a snorkel, and his arm through like a vinyl sleeve or something like that into the puppet. I feel like that man is lucky he lasted until days. the 90s. I bet he put himself in that kind of danger for art a bunch. Yeah, yeah. I always see, you know, they have pictures all over the, the, the Center for Publishing Arts of them performing. And so mm-hmm. they're standing up and their arms are fully outstretched. Yeah. Like they're trying to catch a freaking pop fly that's <laughs> going to go over the wall. Like, and I was thinking to myself, what does that do to your body? Exactly. Yeah, I've always wanted Stretching that. like that, you know, and, 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 and just, I mean, I can't, I mean, sometimes my hand falls asleep driving because <laughs> right. it's like the blood rushes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not young. And, um, <laughs> It's it's amazing to me. Um, anyway, so I, I got, but I read that and I thought that's really fascinating when you think about it. That the idea of not not a puppet from the waist up mm-hmm. like Charlie McCarthy, or a puppet that you you know where you know where the puppeteer is. This is yeah. a freestanding puppet, more or less. Mm-hmm. Um, which is really yeah, that's kind of amazing. Um, and then like the next time you see him, he's riding a bicycle. So they were, you know, one of the things they wanted to do was let's 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 enlarge this concept of what Muppets are about, um, um, you know, unless it's a guy in a costume like Big Bird, right, right, know? right. But um, yeah, so the, you know, they're, they're, I don't know how we got off on this tangent, <laughs> except that uh, I find that remarkable. Um, and the other thing, and this is a, a storytelling thing for me that I think is interesting. That song, Rainbow Connection, it gets really big at the end. It just, it's beautiful the way it grows and grows and grows. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, that's almost like a showstopper song. It's hard to imagine how you would break away from that song and get into a movie. And yet that's the beginning of yeah, the movie. Yeah, that's a good point. Less. And, and yep, as soon as it's over, man, here comes, was it James Coco in the boat? Uh-huh you know lost <laughs> which is funny you know just that whole idea that he would just you know be lost and he's in a rowboat and he's trying to get back to hollywood and he asks a frog <laughs> you know? um there's some funny meta stuff in the movie that i think appealed to me um they, they break the fourth wall um at one point dr teeth they find them because he reads that they left the script behind <laughs> oh <laughs> God, that probably informs so much of my comedy right there. That just yeah. that one bit. Yeah, yeah. And again, but that's also very Looney Tunes. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that reminds me of was it is a duck a muck where the whole cartoon is somebody drawing. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's that's a very similar idea. This idea that they somehow live in this sort of <clears throat> creative nether world. Mm-hmm. Um. So okay, back to whether it's uh, yeah I I I yeah I recommend it wholeheartedly because I just think it's beautiful and it's wonderful, and some people may listen to it and just never get it, and some people may listen to it and be like, this is fantastic. Mm-hmm. They may be disappointed by the movie because they love the album so much, but you know again that's no different from any other comedy. Sure, you know I mean you lock into it or you don't. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, so first of all, this has been a ton of fun i mean i could obviously go on talking about muppets with you all day but uh do we'll do great muppet caper sometime (laughs) yeah that would be a ton of fun do you have uh anything that's coming up that we should know any shows that you're working on or anything this episode is going to come out on when is it coming out hold on i have it here somewhere i promise you oh you know as far away as march 22nd oh okay i'll be in i'll be in london then by the way my first trip to london oh it's beautiful 
I can't wait. Um, yeah, well, I'm working on on uh, Squidbillies. Uh-huh. Is is my current gig um, since Aquatine has gone off the air. I uh, transitioned over to Squidbilly, so we are working on new episodes. We've got, uh, it looked like we were kind of winding down, but I think we've gotten another lease. Awesome. Uh, so we're working on new episodes now. I'm not sure when they air, probably in the fall, but, um, you know, it's, I love that show. It's a great show. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's some really terrific episodes coming. And uh, so that's what I'm working on now. Um, and then I will. I don't know when it's going to come out, but I do have a buddy that you, I, I got you in touch with him. His name is also Jason. Mm-hmm. And he and I have for over a year been talking about a podcast because apparently you can't, you're not allowed to vote anymore unless you have a podcast. Absolutely right. Um, so I don't know when it'll come, but uh, we're calling it the two B's. Mm-hmm. It's about the sort of cultural cross section between uh, the bond movies or the bond phenomenon and the Beatle phenomenon. And how it hit, and where it hit, and why it hit, and why it was big, and wow, yeah. Well, I uh, I will immediately subscribe because that sounds fascinating. It. I hope it will be. <laughs> I hope it will be. Um, and by the way, you're helping me with it, and you don't because you forced me to buy a microphone and uh, learn how to use uh, programming that <laughs> that will <laughs> make that possible. <laughs> Any way that I can participate in another podcast. You know. Yeah, I know, right? You're giving back. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. So yeah, that's 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 me in a nutshell. Can people follow you on Twitter? Um, I don't have a Twitter account. You do not. I have did. Uh-huh. I have one. Uh-huh. I mean, it's out there, but it has. Uh, it I I got locked out. I had like an old. Yeah, I got locked out of it basically Son of a because bitch. my old email I can't access anymore. So I need to get. I, I've been wanting to do that, and I, I in fact I meant to do it before we did this, so I could tell everybody to follow it well by the time this comes out it will be i'll be able to put it on the the page of this episode so people will be able to see whatever it is perfect that's actually would be fantastic yeah i'll do that i always do that and if the and if the two b's are up and running by then then we'll uh, we'll put that in there too that'll be fun i'm excited great um (laughs) well thank you guys very much for listening um and uh you know what i'm doing a comedy album a day trying to i'm a little bit behind right now but i'm listening to a comedy album a day for all of 2017 by the end of the year, no matter what, it'll be 365 that I will have listened to or more. Um, so if you go to youtube.com slash comedy on vinyl, uh, they'll, they'll be right there. There's a if, Actually, if you go to bit.ly forward slash uh, comedy album a day, that'll take you right to the playlist. So you can just watch them there. There are advertisements. I apologize, but I need to make money. Um, also, if you go to uh, by the time this comes out, I'll be finalizing or beginning finalizing my next feature film if you go to lookingforwardmovie.com you can catch up on the 183 videos and 15 plus hours of footage that we put out up for it last year go ahead please watch it all i demand that you watch it all that that's still out there go to bit.ly forward slash soaptown dvd to watch my uh, documentary soaptown lords of soaptown that should be coming out streaming soon as well if it is i'll insert something here telling you where the hell to find that and that's enough for my bullshit um again ned thank you for doing the show please come back thank you jason oh, I, I hope to i can't wait thank you. thank you of course thank you guys for listening and as always have a good thing comedy on vinyl is a production of stolen dress entertainment it is produced by mike warden and is hosted and edited by jason klom our theme song was composed and performed by richard levinson Please visit StolenDress.com to listen to our other podcasts, read our blogs, read our tweets, watch our videos, and read our books. Please subscribe on iTunes, and if you like us, give us a five-star rating and a nice review. You can find us on Facebook.com slash Comedy on Vinyl, Twitter at Comedy on Vinyl, and find everything else at ComedyOnVinyl.com. A major portion of Comedy on Vinyl has been underwritten by Stand Up Records. Please visit StandUpRecords.com for all your comedy needs and tune into the new Stand Up channel available on the Roku, where you can also find select episodes of this podcast. 